Hello, this is going to be a quick tutorial in baking in X-Normal, so let's get to it. So I have this high poly mesh, and I want to bake the ambient occlusion from this high poly mesh onto this low poly mesh that I have right here. Uh, so first thing I need to do is make sure that these two items are exactly on top of each other. So you can see that they are interpenetrating a lot. You can see the different meshes. That is what I want. I want to have as little difference between the low poly mesh and the high poly mesh as I can. I don't want to get too high in my try counts. Uh, so there is some definite differences in different places, but overall, this is the same. It uses the same space and has as little difference between the two as you can. So, I have my high poly mesh here, and this one does not need to be unwrapped. However, the low poly mesh does need to be unwrapped. So I'll just quick show you the unwrap of the low poly. Here's the unwrap, just have the different pieces and sections here. All right. uh, I will be using Maya on this for just demonstration purposes. But we will not be going over Maya at all, it's just to view the models. Okay, so I have exported out this high poly model and this low poly model. Since I have these two models, I'll just bring up X normal and load them in here. So a couple things about X normal. There are tabs here on the right. These first top three are the ones you're going to be most using. Uh, only other one I typically go to is tools for this ray distance calculator, but we'll get to that in a second. So I need to load up, load up my high definition model, or my high poly model in this slot. I can right click in this blank section and add mesh. navigate to where I've saved this and load it in. Now I'll go to my low definition tab here on the right and do the same thing. Right click in this blank area and click on add mesh. Here I'm going to find my low poly. So now I have these two meshes loaded up. Uh, need to set what I'm baking after I have these two loaded up in this baking options. So here's the output file. This is where you're going to save your uh, texture bakes out as. I'm going to put them in this bakes folder and just name it SOPA and save. Uh, here you have your texture size. I'm going to be baking out a 1024 by 1024. Then you have your edge padding. Uh, this is the kind of bleed effect that happens at the corners of your texture so that it doesn't get little white lines when you are uh, have it in a game engine. Uh, next, these things you can usually leave on, and these settings are good as well. Bucket size, this is how large of a square it's going to be rendering at a time. And for this tutorial, I'm going to be baking an ambient occlusion map and a cavity map. So I need to, in this list, find those pieces, which ambient occlusion right here is the fourth one down. I'll just check that on. And we'll just leave it at its default settings for right now. And generate maps. Let's see what we can get. These are the little bucket size I was talking about. That's the square width. It's 32 pixels of a bucket. So you can have larger buckets or smaller buckets. It's really up to you on that point. So I'm going to pause the video here for a second while it loads. All right, so it's finished rendering. Let's see how this texture looks on my mesh. So, just so, so this is what that bake that I just made 
looks like with default settings. Looks pretty okay for the low poly model here compared to the high. But let's say it looks okay, but there's some errors happening in here. Uh, let's say that I actually wanted to have this couch and these pillows be able to move around. If I move these pillows anytime, I have this black spot happening in my couch. So I could not move these pillows around and like set up a, a little bit different arrangement of these pillows. If I wanted to have one pillow maybe in the center, I couldn't do that to add variety to this couch. In order to be able to move these pillows and have them separate so they're not making the dark shadow, I would have to do one of two different ways. One way would be to separate out the the main couch from the pillows and have these as two separate objects that will just bake independently. Have uh, two different high poly files and two different low poly po files. Which is a great method for sometimes, sometimes you have too many meshes and that's just really confusing with all the different pieces. So another way to do that is to just have one file but have the file like these pillows floating up higher so it's not casting that shadow onto the rest of the couch. And that's called kind of an exploding method and that's the way we're going to be doing it today. So I will take both my high, my low poly pillows here, so I'm going to turn off the texture so you can definitely see that this is the low poly, and then we'll take the high poly pillows as well and move those up at the same distance. There, and then save this new file out, both the high poly mesh here, save that one out, yes. and then my low poly mesh as well. And let's go back to X normal. So X normal always looks at this file, this external file. So I don't actually have to reload my meshes again because I just overwrote the last ones that I made. It's just going to look at that same file location and see that it's been updated. So instead of doing anything else, I will just hit the generate maps. See what I get here. I'll pause the video for a second. It doesn't take too long, but but it's longer than what you need. Okay, let's go back to this Maya file for viewing purposes and turn on the texture, which I need to update this one because Maya needs to say reload. There we go. So now I no longer have that big black shadow happening, which is great. Look at my pillows. Those look pretty good. There's a little bit of error still happening in a couple different places, especially on the back of this couch. Um, but not too horrible, just a couple little things. So this is due to the rays not going far enough out, so it just sees this as black right here. So I needed to recalculate how far the little rays are going out from my mesh. So let's go back to X normal. And just go to our tools this time. This is where the ray distance calculator comes into play. So I'm going to click on this and it will have a list of my low poly meshes. I only have one so it just has the one piece in there. I'll click on it and hit go. It's going to start calculating how f much of a difference there is between my low poly mesh and my high poly mesh and give me a couple different numbers. It's not going to tell me when it's done. It's just going to keep on updating in infinitely. Uh, right now it kind of looks like the numbers have stopped, found a good place for it. So I'm going to hit stop on this 
because these val values have stopped changing. It usually only takes a couple of seconds unless you have something really intense. So just wait a little bit if the numbers stop changing a little or are very small amounts. It's good to stop it and you can click copy the results and that's going to apply these values into the proper slots. You used to have to do this manually but this button is amazing. Uh, so I'm going to close this map down and I'll show you where it input them. It put them into this low definition mesh section and it has the maximal frontal ray distance and the rear distance as well and it put these numbers that I just calculated into these slots. So now if I generate my map and it's calculated, I'll go into Maya here and reload. So that got rid of those problems right around the edge. However, it didn't get rid of everything. You can see in the back of this texture, there are still these black and white dots happening here. It's not ideal. Same thing with this. What's happening here is actually that the pillows are kind of like projecting too far. The rays are going way down here and catching a little bit of the couch and giving that black line. And the couch is doing the same thing as it's casting. The rays go too far to find the pillows and then not know what to do with itself. So this is a little bit of a problem. Um, what we're going to do for that is something called a cage. What a cage does is it, um, it's a mesh, a duplicated mesh of your low poly. It has the exact same topology, same edges, same verts, just a little bit bigger. So let me turn on a cage that I made previously. This is kind of like a, a push modifier of sorts. Um, so I just have a transparent texture. I've duplicated the mesh and pushed the vertices away from the, the regular mesh. So this is going to tell the rays how far they can go. They can go from this low poly mesh out to the uh, cage mesh and that's as far as they go. They don't go beyond that. I actually need to move my pillows up now. Shows that, that distance, so go that. So now the rays are going to come out from this stop here and then just be done with it. So it's not going to get any of this pillow mesh um, applied to this couch. So I'm going to export this out as an external cage. Selecting it, export and sofa cage. Go back to X normal. All right, so where do you put in the cage mesh? That's in the low poly because it's the same topology as the low poly. That's where it needs to go. So if I scroll down here, you'll see a little checkbox that says you use cage. I want to check that on. Um, but I don't actually have to. If I right click on this mesh and down here now I have browse for an external cage. When I import a external cage it automatically turns this checkbox on so it's kind of just redundant to turn that on. Uh, so I'm going to browse to find an external cage. I'm going to find my cage file I saved and open. This is just a warning saying that the cage has to be the exact same topology as the low poly mesh, otherwise you'll get errors. This pop-up will always come here. Uh, you can ignore it as long as it's the same topology. Just kind of a little reminder saying, hey, you can't do it without being the exact same. So now that my bag's done, close this out and go back to view it. Let's hide this cage mesh and reload my texture. Oh, that cleaned up just a little bit. Yeah, now look at that back 
section. It's not getting any of that pillow and it's, it's doing a really nice job of baking it for overall. So that's how to use a cage model, at least when you have an external cage. There's also a way to get the cage right inside X normal. So if you're not familiar with any 3D package, uh, you can easily make your cage inside of X normal. Uh, for the if you are familiar with like Max or Maya, it's just kind of a push modifier inside of Max. Uh, it's a little bit different inside of Maya. I'm not going to go over that. All right, let's go into X normal and get our own cage here. So I don't particularly like this method just because the UI is pretty horrible, but we'll do it. Um, so I need to go down to the 3D viewer. And I really don't need to change any of these settings because I already have the files loaded up in here. I just need to say launch the viewer. And it's going to give me some beautiful UI. Uh, yes. <laughs> All right, so the navigation in here is the WAS, W-A-S-D, for like a typical game, and you can move your head around with the right click and drag. So it has my meshes in here. Um, and up here at the top it says use cage, and it'll have a kind of, uh, it might have a gray mesh. I typically change my color up to red so I can see what the cage looks like. And this is going to just be a larger version of the low poly. So let's edit the cage a little bit. You may need to change this global extrude modifier. And this is just kind of your push modifier. And what you want to do is to have none of this high poly mesh sticking out. You want it to be as close as possible, but you don't want to go uh, like way out there because that's just going to cause more issues. But just past the point where it covers all of the high poly. So that looks pretty good. Uncheck edit met cage and I will save my meshes. Let's say I'm going to just call this x normal and it's going to be the file type of an SM, SBM I'll save that and it will do its little thing. It will ask me do I want to auto assign the meshes that I saved into these slots. I will click yes on this and the meshes are saved. Put escape on my keyboard to exit out of that viewer, that wonderful viewer. Now if I go to my high poly definition, it has now replaced my OBJ file with that SBM file for both of these. And in this one, my low poly mesh, it has the use cage checked on, but it doesn't have an external cage file. That's because the SBM saved the cage with the low poly mesh, so it's just kind of uh, check on this, it's not an external one, it's inside of this file itself. So it should be good and all set to go. I can just hit generate maps and it will calculate all that piece for me. Uh, I should note that if I wanted to change anything with the model inside of my inside of Maya, I would have to reload the file because it's no longer looking at that OBJ I saved, it's looking at the SBM but you probably won't run into that. All right, so let's go here and reload the texture, which it should look like pretty much the same. I mean, it's just, a, I still had the cage file and it all looks beautiful. So this is great. Uh, another type of thing is a blocker file, which this is just kind of like, putting a plane or an object in the way. Let's see. So if I had a plane here, I 
I could also just put this in between these two objects. This is, would be an external blocker file. And what I would do with this is save it out as its own file and rename it like blocker or something. And when the rays go down from the pillow down here, it's going to stop it right here. It's not going to give it a distance like the cage was saying, hey, this is how far you go overall. The blocker just says you can go no further once you hit this object. So it bounce back and be all good. So you wouldn't get any projection going on top from this one to the next. This is particularly good for a character, like under the arms and between the legs. Those are very close geometry, so it's pretty often they will project onto each other. Uh, but the blocker file will say, go no further than this, and you don't have to worry about getting a cage just right. But I'm not going to be using this cage, just kind of quick uh, tutorial on that. You would go into your in X normal, the low poly definition, right click, kind of like where you'd find the cage, it's just a little bit lower, it's the very bottom one. You'd browse the blocker file and load it in there. So let's look at this AO a little bit more. So you can kind of see it's a it's got some weird like little lines going on. It's not very clean and I'd like it to be a little bit nicer. Uh, less noise happening in this and where I would go to that is going to my baking options. So in ambient occlusion there's a little dot dot dot. This means the kind of the extension of what how many other options you can get on this. So there's a couple there's quite a few options here but there's only a couple though, that you actually need to change and the kind of noisy look I'm getting here on my mesh is the rays. This is kind of like, it's sometimes called the samples or the rays. And it will send, it determines how many rays are going out. So the higher the value, the smoother your AO bakes are going to be. However, it also increases the render time significantly. Uh, so for a 1024 texture map, I think 512 works pretty well. Uh, it really depends on what texture size you're using and how smooth you want it to be. If you want an overall value, I'd say 600 is good for most things. Um, it's going to take a little bit longer, but I like 512. Another one is the spread angle. And this is um, more darkness will cluster in the corners with the spread angle. Uh, the higher the value of the spread, it's gonna the darkness will spread out farther and farther. So this goes from 0.5 to 159.5 uh, for its max values. I think the defaults are pretty good. You can have it up higher or lower. We'll try it at max here for this one. Um, it's a pretty smooth surface, so I don't need to have super dark clusters. I want it to kind of be spread everywhere. The uh, only other one I would change occasionally is the limit ray distance. Uh, this is also called like the max different distance. It basically says the ray can go this far, and that's it. It's uh, kind of like a cage, but more manually you have to decide how far this can go. And that's a little bit harder to calculate, but we'll close this and call those settings good. So this is going to take a little bit longer now uh, because I have more rays. I also have this little checkbox of file overwrite warning off, so when I'm re-saving this PNG I don't get a warning every time. Uh, I don't like that. So I'm going to hit generate on this and it's going to be going for a little bit longer. Okay, done with the AO bake. And I'll close this and reload it in Maya. So take a look at this before and after. You can definitely see the overall spread is uh, darker for everything. The It's not so with the spread value at the max, um, the spread, it's the darkness isn't 
clustering or gathering as much in the corners. It's spread out, so the overall look is a lot more darker. Uh, but it definitely doesn't have as much of that kind of rays going on there. I might want to up it even more, but I'm not going to for this demonstration. This big looks pretty good. Uh, I would then move my pillows back into place. And now I have these pillows kind of separate and I can move them around as I need to. So that is AO baking. Last thing I want to go over is the cavity maps. So I'm going to uncheck the ambient occlusion since I'm done with that particular map and go down to cavity maps and check that one on. We'll just use the default settings on this. So a cavity map is pretty similar to the AO map, but it's much tighter. It only gets in the little crevices or cavities of the model. So the little lines of the couch, little seams, it gets it defines those small areas much better so you can get more control having both a broad shadows and the very tight ones. Alright, so we have that. Let's load that up in my We'll just replace this one. And here in my file I have, I named it as sofa, and it always puts an underscore and what kind of map you made. So ambient occlusion has occlusion as its name, and cavity is just underscore cavity. Pretty simple naming convention, very easy to use. So here's my cavity map, obviously very tight version of it. Uh, and that's baking ambient occlusion and... Uh, cavity maps in X normal. I hope this helps. See you next time.